Hello, this is Dr. Grant Cooper from Princeton Spine and Joint Center with another uh, office hours conversation where we try to answer the questions you've been sending in, which we very much appreciate. There is a question that came up a lot on the degenerative disc disease uh, video that, that we did, where um, people were frankly not um, happy with me for uh, suggesting or saying that people can have degenerative disc findings on an MRI and not have pain. And that somehow by saying that, I was minimizing people's people who are going through pain from their disc. And of course, I was, I was not trying to do that at all. And I think um, somehow yeah. I, I, I miscommunicated or didn't communicate thoroughly enough. So let me, I, I wanted to try to take a moment to articulate what I was trying to get across. And that is that on an MRI, you can have findings of an annular tear in the disc or degenerative disc disease. And those, those MRI findings can exist in somebody who is pain-free. But at the same time, those, MRI, those same MRI findings can exist in somebody who is in misery, who is in 10 out of 10 pain, who you know, can't, can't get off the bed. And it is to no way minimize the pain that that person is really having from the disc. It's just, it's important that when we get an MRI, that we remember that just because we see something on an MRI doesn't mean that that's necessarily causing the symptoms. And so we need to put the, the findings of an MRI into the context of the whole patient. And that's why we end up treating patients and, and not just MRIs, right? People can have horrific pain that, comes, that come from discs. Um, and also people can be going through life with an MRI that looks bad, uh, but they're just, but they're not having any symptoms. And it becomes especially important when someone gets an MRI for something unrelated and someone tells them that they, they have these disc findings and they think, but I, I feel okay. You know, what, 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 what am I supposed to do something about that? And the point is, no, those can be just sort of, you know, part of, part of the disc getting going on and going through wear and tear. But that's not to minimize the fact that somebody can absolutely have horrific pain from the disc. And as someone who's, who's had disc pain in the past, I know that that can be extremely painful, extremely debilitating, and we take it very seriously. Uh, but again, it's just to, to contextualize the MRI when you get those diagnostic studies. I hope that I, I answered that, 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 that those, those questions because that came up a, a few times. This one was about uh, do young people get disc pain and degenerative disc disease? It's a great question. Um, and it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a two-part question. So the first part is absolutely young people. Um, in fact, disc pain is the most common cause of chronic lower back pain, chronic being anything longer than three months in, uh, younger people. Well, actually in, in all ages, but especially in younger people, it is by far the most common cause of chronic lower back pain. Now, when we talk about disc pain in young, in, in young people or disc pain, just generally. We're not exactly talking about degenerative disc disease. It's, it's a little bit nuanced. We're talking about a tear, an annular tear, which is part of degenerative disc disease on the inside of the disc. So what causes disc pain is when there's a tear that extends from the inside of the disc, where there are inflammatory proteins, to the outside of the disc, to the outer third of the annulus fibrosis specifically, where there are nerve fibers. And then what happens is those inflammatory proteins start to ooze out and they irritate those nerve fibers, and that's what causes disc pain. And then things that tend to put more pressure on the disc, like sitting, bending forward, those things tend to exacerbate that kind of pain. Degenerative disc is, is sort of sometimes used synonymously, but what it really is, is as the disc starts to lose the fluid inside of the disc and it kind of gets pancaked, it gets what we would call degenerative. Um, you can have a tear. It, a tear is sort of part of that process. But you could have a tear in a disc that otherwise doesn't look degenerated. And you could have a disc that's very dried out, very degenerative, that's not necessarily causing pain. But even in young people, even, even in young people like late teenage, 20s, certainly 30s, um, you're going to start to get some wear and tear in the disc. It's not that uncommon to start to see signs of degenerative disc. And it's certainly not uncommon in somebody with chronic back pain to have an annular tear young oral, frankly. This one was about can spinal cysts or cysts around the spine cause neuropathic symptoms? Like cause like, I'm, I'm understanding that question as can, it, can a spinal cyst cause 
nerve-like symptoms in the leg. Um, that's, that's, that's how I, that's what I believe the question is. And it's a good question. And it's one that, that actually comes up a fair amount, especially, uh, well, in all sorts of circumstances. So here's the, here's how that works. Spine, cysts in the spine, the, the most common would be a cyst coming off of the facet joint. Um, and you can have a cyst in the spine that is not causing any symptoms and you don't have to do anything about it. You can also have a cyst in the spine that starts to compress a nerve root, in which case it can cause sciatic-like symptoms. Essentially, the cyst uh, creates stenosis, creates narrowing around the nerve root. And just like anything else that would create narrowing, narrowing around the nerve root, that can cause inflammation or compression of the nerve root, which will then cause sciatic-like symptoms into the leg, like you know, radiating pain, numbness, tingling, sometimes weakness. And then obviously this has to be addressed. A couple of important points on that. Uh, number one, if you have sciatic leg symptoms and you happen to have a cyst in the spine, you know, you still have to make sure that it's, it's coming from that level. Again, you could, you, you could look at an MRI and you could have a cyst that's just, you know, an incidental finding and something else is actually causing the symptoms. When the cyst is uh, either contributing to or solely causing the stenosis and the symptoms from the nerve root, you, you treat it a, usually a little bit differently than you would other kinds of stenosis because here you have a, an extra option. So option number one is to treat it like any other kind of stenosis where you basically just treat the inflammation around the nerve root um, and you treat the, the cyst as, as any, any other kind of stenosis, any other stenosis causing agent like the joint or the disc. Um, but when it's a cyst that's, caused, that's, that's, that's creating the narrowing, you can also address the cyst itself. And you know the, the, the three ways that, that you can do that. One, you can try to aspirate the fluid out of the cyst with a needle, sort of like you're, you're just draining it, which decompresses the cyst. Um, sometimes that works well. Sometimes what happens is you aspirate it and then slowly but surely the cyst just fills up again. If that happens, you can also try and pop it. Um, like you're, well, I don't think you should pop zits, but kind of like that. You're, 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 you're putting extra pressure in and then you're going to basically try to um, explode the cyst. If you do that, it needs to be done very carefully because as you're blowing up the cyst, you're putting more and more pressure on the nerve root. So there is a bunch of technical and, and other considerations that you and the doctor need to talk about with that. And finally, surgically, you can, you can go in and you can take out the cysts. Uh, this question was from someone who asked, is my numbness and tingling coming uh, because of my diabetes? Should I be controlling my sugars more? Um, I'm paraphrasing that. But it's a question that, that um, I was just talking to my producer. We, we, we get this a lot, both on the, 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 the YouTube channel and also in the office, about people coming in and they're, they're very concerned um, that either they're diabetic or they're pre-diabetic and they're worried that their numbness and tingling uh, must be coming because of the diabetes and that it's only gonna get worse no matter what they do. So, okay, Whew. deep breath, a few things. First of all, diabetes absolutely can cause a peripheral neuropathy. Usually, if it's going to, it's gonna be someone with diabetes for a long time, often where the sugars have been uncontrolled. Definitely, if you have diabetes, you want to be controlling your sugars uh, as well as possible. If you're, you know, and, and, and the, the possibility of a neuropathy or the actuality of a neuropathy, if you have one from the diabetes, only makes it all the more important to be controlling your sugars as well as possible. Now, with that said, if you have numbness and tingling, there are, there's a textbook worth, textbook worth of reasons that can be causing that numbness and tingling. Diabetes is the most common for certain kinds of neuropathies, but it's just one of many, many, many. So if you have numbness and tingling, first of all, on one side, and if you have like, you know, leg pain and back pain, that's almost certainly not coming from diabetes. It's almost certainly coming more from like a pinched nerve in your back or an inflamed nerve root, sciatica, something like that. If you have numbness and tingling in both of your legs, uh, then diabetes goes higher up on the list. It is the most common uh, identifiable cause of the causes that, that we look for, but it's still the minority, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a large minority of the, of the causes. So it's something that needs to get worked up. You want to make sure there's not any number of other kinds of, of, of things causing the neuropathy. So for example, 
Lyme disease, low folate, uh, low B12, low thyroid. There's all sorts of reversible, uh, treatable causes that can look like a diabetic neuropathy, but it's really coming from something else, even in somebody with diabetes. And of course, more than one thing can be contributing to uh, a neuropathy or to numbness and tingling in your legs. So long story, a little bit shorter. If you have numbness and tingling, you want to get it worked up. It is something that can be found out if it's coming from your diabetes uh, or from something else. So you don't want to be just sitting on it. You want to start getting it looked at and probably start with a nerve test. Um, if that nerve test shows a generalized neuropathy, it probably leads to some blood work and you, you just you, you follow that algorithm out. Um, diabetes is one important potential cause, but it's just one of many. So you want to make sure you're getting it worked up um, so that you can get to the bottom of it and start the process of hopefully getting it better. Thank you so much for your question. Please keep those questions coming in. I'll see you in the next one.